Hi, I'm Shannon Rice, a podcast producer here at C-SPAN Radio. Afterwards is taking a break this week, so we're showcasing an episode of Q&A that is the perfect fit for this July 4th weekend. Afterwards, we'll be back with a new episode in this feed on July 9th. Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. As the U.S. celebrates Independence Day, we've invited University of Michigan musicology professor Mark Clegg to discuss his new book, Oh, Say Can You Hear? He spent a decade researching the history and cultural impact of the Star-Spangled Banner, written by Francis Scott Key in 1814. He explains how the song became our national anthem, how the anthem became widely used at sporting events, sometimes as a vehicle for protest, and public reactions to renditions of the song performed by Jimi Hendrix, Whitney Houston, Roseanne Barr, and others. Mark Clegg, that was Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock in 1969 uh, with his very well-known version of the Star-Spangled Banner. In your new book, Oh Say Can You Hear, you tell readers that your journey of, of uh, learning about the Star-Spangled Banner really became, began with playing that video for your students in your class over a decade ago. Tell me the story. Yeah, no, I'm just smiling as I, I hear it because it's to me it's still the most amazing performance of the Star Spangled Banner in history. Jimi Hendrix, Woodstock, August 1969. I mean, a part of a big, huge countercultural festival, a moment when sort of the youth of America are are envisioning a, a different future for the nation. And uh, yeah, I teach a course in American music at the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance um, for first year students. And I think partially to try to make myself look cool, I uh, I play Jimi Hendrix and uh, the Star. Spangled Banner, because I figure if I'm talking about American music, what could be more American music than the Star Spangled Banner? And uh, their questions really led me on a quest that's taken more than a decade um, to try to figure out where this song came from, what it has meant in different moments in American history. And it, it's been an incredible journey for me. But it really started with Hendrix at Woodstock and this sort of musical fusion of patriotism and protest, um, sort of reflecting sort of the turmoil of the 1960s and one of rock's greatest moments. You describe your book as a cultural biography. What's that mean? Well, I I thought of the Star Spangled Banner almost as if a a kind of witness, almost as a person, if you will, um, that was living through these pivotal moments of American history. And and one of my big, I think, insights or or at least beliefs about the the song is that it's actually a living document. It's not a frozen icon. It's it's not something that's static. It's something that's constantly changing. It's alive and it's and it's brought to life in performance by people like Jimi Hendrix. But but every time we sing the song, we sort of, you know, elevate the questions and the the tension and the 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 crisis and the 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 hope that's in that song anew. And for me, it's a living document to history. So that's why I called it a biography. You became very, very uh, interested in the the Star Spangled Banner, obviously, to spend so much time. And you say that Jimi Hendrix himself was obsessed with it and uh, performed it more than 70 times over the course of two years. Uh, What does that fact say to you about the role of this song in our society? Yeah, I mean, most people think of Hendrix because of this iconic moment in the Woodstock documentary film as having sort of spontaneously played the song only once. And in fact, he started playing it just over a year prior to Woodstock, and he continued to play it all the way up through his death, which was almost exactly a year after Woodstock. And and for me, you know, what I think Hendrix was doing was trying to figure out who he was and his relationship to the nation, you know, by by sort of fingering and practicing the song on his 
on his guitar. He was singing it with the strings of a guitar in a way that that became his own personal expression of what it meant to be American. I mean, as a, a mixed race man at a time of a sort of racial, you know, t- tumult and the civil rights movement, the death of Martin Luther King, his murder. So it's it's just you know he was trying to figure out where did he belong as a person within American history. And I think that's the, the fascinating thing to me about this song. Again, if, if we think of it as a living document, as something that's constantly in flux, that's constantly changing, it, it sort of resonates, if you will, with the, the historical moment at which it's performed. And this, this change really over the last 200 years, I mean, the song was written in 1814. The melody comes from the time of our own Revolutionary War. And so I think we have a whole history of America in this song, but it's because it, re- it resonates and responds um, through the artistry of the people performing them, through really everyday Americans singing it and performing it, that, that I think give it its meaning today. He wrote it in 1814. What year did it become officially the national anthem? Well, this is interesting. I mean, officially it became the national anthem on March 3rd, 1931, but unofficially, or at least within American cultural practice, it becomes the national anthem, I think, via destiny, if you will, on July 4th, 1861, which is the 4th of July at the beginning of the U.S. Civil War, the moment when by law... The number of stars on the flag, and I have the the 1814 flag here in the background, um, but the number of stars is supposed to be adjusted to match the number of states. And so um, Lincoln, the the federal government, does not recognize the states that have seceded as as having left the Union, and so the number of stars on the the flag stay the same. And at that moment, the flag, um, the Star Spangled Banner, becomes the sacred symbol of Union. And the song, the Star Spangled Banner, becomes the rallying cry of the Union forces. And so I think it's at that moment the sacrifices of of literally the lives of, of soldiers, you know, fighting in this country to end slavery and preserve the Union is what makes the song sacred to us. So the song was, was used by people as the national anthem and referred to as the national hymn or the national anthem as early as the 1830s, 100 years before it officially became the anthem. So really the government just... Congress and President Hoover, who signed the bill, were sort of coming late to the party, if you will, and and recognizing something that was already true in American cultural practice, um, officially in American law. It isn't just the period in which the Star Spangled Banner was written, but the writer of the Star Spangled Banner that makes it controversial for some people today. So a little bit more about Francis Scott Key's biography. You write that he's solely remembered for this song, but he did so much more. Tell me about him. Yeah, he's an he's an amazing figure in history and someone who is largely a you know a big question mark for me when I started this research. I mean, I I grew up in uh, in in Michigan um, where I teach, and actually I was born in Ann Arbor in 1966. So I was nine years old in 1976 when the nation celebrated its bicentennial, and I think I really just fell in love with the ideals, the notion of the idea of America. The Star Spangled Banner has held meaning for me for all these years. And I sort of knew the basics of the myth that Francis Scott Key was like prisoner on a British ship and that he saw the flag after the Battle of Baltimore and and sort of instantaneously this lyric appeared in his mind. Um, The truth of the story is, is much more interesting, I think. And that's part of what's fascinating about history is getting into the details that lie behind the mythology. And one of those issues is really who was Francis Scott Key. And I think of him as a founding son of the nation. So he's that that next generation. He was born in 1779. Um, So, you know, right after the the revolution, his father um, fought in the Revolutionary War. Um, His uncle was actually a British loyalist. And and so that's the beginning of the complications of, of Francis Scott Key, who's sort of from a contemporary perspective on both sides of the issue. And the the big issue of the day, of course, is slavery. And Francis Scott Key was both a slave owner and someone who, as as a lawyer in the District of Columbia, represented black Americans suing for their freedom from slavery. And one of the things that came up in the course of my research, which I think has been underappreciated about Key, is the the amount of work he did as a legal advocate for blacks suing for freedom. And he filed um, over 100 cases on behalf of black men, women, and children, and was successful in freeing um, 189 people during his legal career. So that doesn't fit the sort of 
good guy, bad guy story today of a, a he's sort of an anti-slavery slave owner, if you will. And that doesn't make any sense um, to us today where you're either on on the abolition side or the, the pro-slavery side. And I think it, it shows how throughout American history we've been struggling with what the notion of freedom means, what, what our ideals mean, how they apply. And Francis Scott Key, like a lot of people in his era, another one is uh, John Jay, who was the first um, chief justice of the Supreme Court who founded the New York Manumission Society to end slavery, but also owned slaves himself. So um, people were on in the sort of pre-Civil War era, were on both sides of the issue, sort of looking for, I think, in Key's case, a pragmatic solution. And one of those solutions was the creation of the American Colonization Society, which attempted to get slave owners to voluntarily um, release their enslaved um, laborers. And and by law at that time in states like Virginia, it was required to remove people from the state if they were freed. And so the Colonization Society offered to take people to Africa, which was an inherently racist thing because you couldn't take someone back to Africa who was actually an American. I mean, born in the United States was an American, um, you know, natural born person, and but not recognized as a, as a citizen at that time. So the colonization society had this sort of mythical idea that slavery could all be ended pre- peacefully and that no one would get hurt and the Civil War wouldn't be necessary. And Key was a, a major figure in the creation and fundraising for that society. In addition to his work responsible for uh, the freedom of a couple hundred uh, uh, black Americans, uh, what was his attitude or his uh, approach to the enslaved people in his life? So, I mean, he followed family tradition in referring to um, enslaved people in his household, and there were at least five um, enslaved people in his Georgetown house um, as, quote-unquote, servants um, rather than as, as slaves. Um, I think it was sort of a euphemism. Um, I think he saw himself as benevolent, as caring for people and, and saw those who were, were enslaved to his household as people. Um, I don't think he saw them as equals. Um, that would have been very unusual, certainly for the era. Um, but one of the interesting things he did is he freed all those who were enslaved to his household during his lifetime, either seven of them you know, during his lifetime and then the rest by um, his last will and testament. And uh, he would provide training, like job training, skills training, by apprenticing um, people enslaved to his household to like a blacksmith shop or something like that in order to allow them to learn a trade to be financially independent. So one of his claims was is that he opposed abolition because he didn't want to see slavery end so precipitously that it would leave um, black Americans in poverty. You know, um, so when he freed his own slaves, um, he always, you know, had them have trainings that allowed them to to be contributors to society, to to make a living. And that was actually opposed to the rhetoric that he represented with the American Colonization Society, which said that if African-Americans have freed, had to be removed from the United States and taken away. And he had a rather famous brother-in-law. He did, Roger Taney. Um, and Taney is, is also a bit of an enigma, um, he's, you know, sort of justly vilified by... American history as the author of the Dred Scott decision, which which took away um, the constitutional rights of black Americans or made it clear that they had none. Um, this was in the run up to the Civil War in, I think, 1854. Um, but Taney also, you know, is complicated. He freed his, his own slaves in the 1820s and he supported the Amistad decision as well, which um, famously was a slave ship that that um, John Quincy Adams represented their their rights and, and resulted in the release of all of the, the sort of captives of that ship. So, you know, I, I think one of the things about history is it's never as simple as it as it seems, and and even Tawny you know, probably deserves at least some reconsideration. In the War of eighteen twelve, was Francis Scott Key a civilian, or had he enlisted to serve? He did enlist. I mean, he's if he's a soldier, he's a bumbling soldier. Um, so he worked as a quartermaster very briefly in the militia um, defending um, Georgetown. And then he, during the Battle of Bladensburg, which was about a month before the attack on Fort McHenry, when British troops marched almost unopposed into Washington, D.C. and desecrated the sort of federal um, buildings of the, the city, burning the Capitol building, burning the president's home, burning the Navy yards, burning the patent office. Um, he was sort of running uh, messages back and forth between the commanders. So he, he was, you know, considered a, a sort of uh, an upper class 
gentleman in in the city of Georgetown and and sort of had certain rights and privileges thereof. He did volunteer. He was opposed to the War of 1812, but sort of um, when British troops were threatening his own hometown and his own family, he volunteered to fight in the war. But I, his total service is probably just a couple weeks, not a major uh, military figure, not an important military figure. And that's one reason why he was expendable. He was able, they were able to send him on this mission to rescue or to negotiate the release of William Baines, who was a uh, doctor, a physician who was captured um, in the aftermath of the Battle of Washington. And that's what put and brought he to Baltimore at all to witness the attack on Fort McHenry. How did he happen to find himself on a ship watching the British bombardment of Fort McHenry? Yeah, one of the the interesting things in my book, I have this this really cool map that that I was helped with. Actually, the the cartographer from the Washington Post um, worked with me on this, and and he really got into it. So it's incredibly detailed, and it it gives the the seventeen days leading up to. Um, Key's sort of you know, publishing the first version of the Star Spangled Banner. And he starts in Washington, D.C. He finds out from a, a family member that the physician William Baines has been captured. He's sent on this mission by President Madison. Um, he is definitely a, an insider figure in American politics, even though he was never a politician, an elected politician himself. Um, he ends up going to Baltimore. Um, basically hiring a, a, sh- a boat to take him and John Skinner, who's the U.S. agent of prisoners, out to rendezvous with the British fleet. And at this point, it's really not certain what the British fleet would do. Um, but when Key is aboard ship um, negotiating the release of, of William Baines, um, the British High Command decides they're going to go after Baltimore. And Baltimore is a particular thorn in the side of the British. It's the third largest city in the United States in 1814. And it's also a sh- an important shipyard. And the Baltimore Clippers were these very fast ships that were used as marauders to harass um, British commercial shipping. And so when the, the War of 1812 was declared, one of the things that was done is that um, privateers, so sort of American um, captains and ships were were given permission to uh, seize the cargo of British merchant ships. And so this was a kind of economic warfare. And the British fleet was in the Chesapeake in the summer of 1814, um, really to, to get revenge, to harass the American coastline and to the American government. And really attacking Baltimore was a, a prime target because a lot of these ships that had been um, capturing British goods came out of Baltimore. And so they wanted revenge. Um, they really wanted to uh, get past Fort McHenry into Baltimore Harbor, sort of be able to attack the city with cannon in order to um, defeat the ground forces that were defending the city, and then really to come in and, and burn the city to the ground and, and take its wealth um, sort of as retribution for the, the damage that Baltimore's um, Navy and, well, sh- shipmen um, had caused them. So it was it was an intense battle. And I think when Key saw that Fort McHenry held, he saw the bravery of the American soldiers, both militia and um, part of the, the federal forces that defended Fort McHenry. You know, they were really outgunned. I mean, British um, ships had the most advanced weapons um, that had ever been constructed at this time. Their bomb ships could shoot farther and with bigger munitions than the fort could respond to. So they were basically sitting ducks, but they had the, the courage to to stay there and hold the fort against all odds. And th- those odds turned in their favor, and Key really saw this as a kind of divine miracle, a kind of saving of the country, um, both their heroism, their unity, um, their bravery, you know, but also really, really God sort of smiling on the country and, and sort of guaranteeing the, the the promise of the country going forward. So it's that spark of hope that um, inspires him to write the Star Spangled Banner. So on board that ship with a looking glass, he kept his eye on the flag over Fort McHenry. One of the facts in your book is the size of the flag made it a little easier for him to follow. How large was it? The flag is is enormous. I mean, it's it's preserved now in the Smithsonian Museum of American History, but it's it's one of the largest flags um, sort of created. I, th- I think certainly at the time, and it was um, commissioned by um, the uh, I think it was a general. I'm trying to think, it was a general or uh, who was defending his, his name is Armistead was um, in command of the fort, and he wanted a flag that was so large, I think it's like 50 by 30 feet, I can't remember the exact dimensions, but wanted a, a basically a, a flag that was so large that the British could see it from a distance and that they would see it as a challenge and as a, a signal of resistance. And so 
the the flag really you know is a symbol and it's key who sort of grabs onto that flag i mean of course it's a very practical symbol for him i mean he's he's like six miles from the fort i mean people don't know exactly where he is um he's probably moved during the battle um the british really thought it was going to be in a quick battle that they would would win in a matter of hours just like they did in washington dc so the amount of resistance they faced was a surprise but the flag became a symbol of that resistance and as long as the flag was there he could see that the Americans still held the fort, that there was still hope that Baltimore would be saved. And, and his own um, you know, wife's sister lived in Baltimore. Um, he, had, he had family and friends there. For him, this was a very personal attack. And so he was very disillusioned with the British, who he had long admired. Um, he was of British descent himself. And so you know, his you know, own disillusionment with the British is, is another thing that's, that's clear in the lyric of the song. So speaking of the lyrics, I want to spend a little bit of time on them because uh, he had three days to write them. But you do make the point that as a lawyer, he was a man of words and words were very important to him. And uh, so the, the, the paying attention to his lyrics is, part, is a very important part of the story. So the first verse, the one that we always hear, what's notable about it is that it ends with a question. Can you talk about the first verse that's so familiar to us? Yeah, I think part of what makes the verse so powerful is the way it tells the story of the battle. Um, so he is is witnessing aboard really his own American true ship. I mean, they're transferred back to the ship. He's under guard, so he is effectively a prisoner, but he's not on a British ship. He's on an American ship. He's watching this bombardment overnight, and it's just it's just horrific. I mean, just bomb after bomb. I mean, hundreds of musicians hurled at the fort. Um, they fortunately did not land with devastation Um a sort of devastative impact. They, you know, the, the very few casualties were actually exercised at the fort. It's, a, it's an earthworks fort that's really sort of embedded in the land and so was, was actually pretty resistant to these attacks. But he saw the rockets and bombs going above. So when you hear those, those high notes that are so difficult to sing in the Star Spangled Banner, the rocket's red glare and the bombs bursting in air, that's the moment of tension um, for him, like seeing this, these explosive musicians hurling at the American defenses and knowing the risk that the soldiers had facing these attacks. And so, you know, that's there. And then I think the, the flag is really becomes the symbol of, of, you know, what the results of the battle, you know, are. And it's, it's an interesting time to think back to 1814. I mean, this is not a time where there's any electronic communication. There's no, certainly no Twitter, no radio, you know, no, no radar, no, all those things we think of with warfare today. This is a time when there's very little information. The only thing you really know is, is the flag still there or not? And so that's the critical question for, for Key that represents, you know, who's in control of the fort and, and whether his nation has a future. So the, the first verse does end with a question mark. Interestingly, we tend to think of it today when we sing it, as, as sort of representing this powerful nation that we became. I mean, in 1814, we were not a particularly powerful nation. The, the British were on our shores. They had walked into our capital city. We were unable to repulse them. They were basically attacking cities along the eastern seaboard at will. So Key gives a vision for what he hopes the country will become. And so that question mark really, for me, there's it's a really sort of powerful notion of will we live up to the, the example of the heroes of Fort McHenry? Will we be the land of the free? Will we be the home of the brave? And so when we sing it today, I think it's really interesting to, to think about the question mark, which for Key was literal, but also symbolic. And for us today, when we you know, sort of bring the song alive again, I think it asks that question, and will we have the courage to participate? So for me, the, the song is a call to citizenship, especially in that first verse. So how does he carry the story along in the second, third, and fourth verses? So the second verse is really about um, the uncertainty. Um, so he's asked in the first verse, is the flag still there? He's in the second verse, he's talking about sort of the clouds and the mist of the, the next morning, trying to see after night when he couldn't see the flag because it was dark. Um, the bombing has stopped. So this, this creates an ambiguity. Um, so if the bombing stopping could mean that the British gave up. It could also mean that they won, that they took over the fort and they're, they're no longer attacking their own forces, you know, who are in the fort. So the nightfall and the darkness creates this uncertainty. And the second verse is about that um, on the shore, dimly seen through the mists of the deep. Um, and then the, the flag is sort of fluttering. He sees the flag on the pole through his spyglass, but he, you know, it's the wind has not picked it up. It's, it's hanging you know, down. So he can't tell which flag it is, if it's the Union Jack or if it's the Star Spangled Banner. And then it catches the breeze and he sees that, that the flag is there. 
Um, the third verse is really about vilifying the enemy. And, and this, I think, is one of the most controversial verses. It's a verse that was left out of um, school textbooks starting in the 1890s, out of, out of church hymnals starting in the Civil War. Um, it's, it's not, in, in a sense, a part of the official Star Spangled Banner, arguably, but it's the, the verse that contains the word slave, which is very alienating for a lot of people today because of the legacy of slavery in the nation. So, But the third verse really is vilifying the bad guys, the British enemy that he has been disillusioned by. And then the, the fourth move, verse is really the verse of triumph. It's the verse of hope. And, and it's where he sees this vision of a land where free men shall stand between their loved homes and the world's desolation. You know, he, he sees this as the heaven rescued land, as a land which God is, is trusted, as, you know, our trust in God. Um, that line that's on our coins sort of is first invoked in that fourth verse. And that's the, the, the verse of triumph and hope and really of challenge to future generations. On that controversial language in the third verse, hireling and slave, you investigated what it might have meant to people in 1814. What did you find? Yeah, this was really one of the things I struggled with. It's why I dug so deeply into Francis Scott Key's biography, his own legacy of slaveholding. Um, And what really surprised me and and went against my intuitions as a historian initially was that probably the word slave meant different things in 1814 than it does to us now. So I explore three possible interpretations of the word um, in 1814. Um, The first would be sort of the way we would think of the word today as actually referring to um, black men, women, and children held captive as labor in the colonies or in in the early America, which was the law of the land at the time. And uh, abolitionists and, and certainly... Um, you know, African Americans would have seen an incredible irony of a song celebrating freedom invoking the word slave. Um, f- amazingly, for most Americans, most white Americans at this time, and particularly white male Americans, who were the citizens, who were the voters, who were the people who had political power and authority um, in 1814, um, they would have seen the word slave or would have interpreted it probably in a pretty myopic way, which is that the, the word slave is used a lot in American patriotic rhetoric in um, going back to the revolutionary period and certainly in the War of 1812 is what we sometimes call the second war of American independence. And it referred to the distinction between Europe, which was a land of kings, um, in which citizens were subjects, um, not free independent um, operators. And so what was celebrated after the Revolutionary War was was the was liberty right that's was freedom was the notion that that american citizens white men could decide whether to fight in a war or not and in england when you had king george so it's the same king that we revolted from in in 1776 is still king um in 1812 in the war of 1812 um so the the king is the one who orders his subjects into battle in britain so the contrast in the third verse is really, which is really about the British enemy, is is making a distinction between the British bad guys who were vassals and subjects of King George, who were not fighting of their own free will, who were hirelings, who were were sort of professional soldiers, who were fighting for money, for the spoils of war, you know, to take the wealth of the city of Baltimore, um, to ransom cities on the on the coast of America. So they were hirelings and they were slaves in that they they fought at the king's behest rather than our own free will. And so American militiamen, by contrast with the good guys, were not paid. They were volunteers and they were free to choose to fight or not. And so it's I think that's really what the word slave would have been read for by by most sort of mainstream, you know, you she can read as white Americans um, in 1814. The other thing I found really interesting, the third interpretation, which actually is what I think personally is probably what was motivating Francis Scott Key himself, is that what's interesting about that phrase, hireling and slave, is that it's not plural. It's not hirelings and slaves talking about all the British enemy, but it's singular hireling and slave. And I think Key actually was thinking very specifically about Major General Robert Ross, who was the leader of the British um, contingent. He had ordered the burning of Washington. He had ordered the imprisonment of William Baines. And so the fact that it switches so distinctively in that phrase, and this is where Key's background as a lawyer, the precision of his use of language, I think is important, that he he uses the singular to talk about the hireling and slave. And I, I we know 
that he on aboard ship for three days, you know, trapped after the Battle of Baltimore under guard, knew very little information about what actually happened at the battle. But one thing we do know is that John Skinner, who is the U.S. agent of prisoners, was shuttling back and forth, um, keeping track of casualties, negotiating the release of other prisoners who had been taken during the, the land attack on Baltimore up North Point. And one of the things... Um, Skinner reports back to Washington, D.C., we can see in his official letters, is that he found out that Major General Robert Ross was killed by an American sniper. And so um, and then actually dragged back quickly on a litter um, to the shore and died en route. Um, so the the actual language that he uses about the terror of flight and the groom, gloom of the grave really applies very specifically to Major General Robert Ross. And I think that's probably what he was thinking in the sort of elevated um, aristocratic language of the day. It would have been impolite um, and sort of gauche to to name the, the British enemy and sort of mock his death um, with his name. I think he would have seen that as inappropriate. So he he refers to it more symbolically and more abstractly. We are at the halfway point of our conversation with Mark Clegg on his cultural history of the Star-Spangled Banner. Now, one of the myths that you dispel is that it was a poem written by Francis Scott Key. It was later sent to music. What's the reality of the story? Yeah, when you see the lyrics of the Star-Spangled Banner, it looks like a poem. I mean, it's words on a piece of paper. Um, and you know, it's a rhyme scheme and, and all of those things we expect poetry to have. What was really common in early American political discourse was writing songs to reflect um, certain important pivotal moments in American life. So, you know, campaign songs, Fourth of July songs, um, songs about uh, particular controversies, you know, war, um, party songs of, of the Federalists or the Democratic Republicans, who were the two major parties in Francis Scott Key's lifetime. So this this tradition of political songwriting was alive and well. And with the way political songwriting worked is that you took a melody that was already well known and you wrote new words to fit that melody. And this was done with tunes like Yankee Doodle, which was had sort of short, pithy lines and can be used to insult people. Um, so that tends to be the way that, that melody is used. And then the melody that we know today as the Star Spangled Banner actually has its origins in London in 1773 as the anthem of a musician's club called the Anacreontic Society. And this melody was brought to the United States by a group of London actors, introduced into York and as early as 1793 so so some 20 years a little bit more before the writing of the Star Spangled Banner people in America started writing topical political lyrics to be sung to the tune of Anacreon in heaven um and this you know was exactly what Francis Scott Key did in 1814 the first really sort of hit if you will uh lyric to this tune is called Adams and Liberty and uh you know, it was about President John Adams, the second president of the United States, and it it's offered support to him during the so-called quasi-war um, with France in 1798. It led to the Alien and Sedition Acts, sort of a, a, a pivotal moment in American legal history, um, not necessarily a, a very flattering one for, for the country, um, but an, an important one nonetheless. And this song sort of gave voice to Federalist Party support for John Adams. It was then used as a campaign song for Thomas Jefferson. It was used for Fourth of July songs. And it actually was used by Francis Scott Key in 1805. So nine years prior to writing the Star Spangled Banner, he writes his first song that we know about called When the Warrior Returns. It's a song celebrating the heroism of Stephen Decatur, who is a, a captain in the U.S. Navy fighting in the, the Barbary War in um, North Africa. And uh, he had was sort of being paraded around the, the East Coast and celebrated by various communities for his heroism. And one of those places was uh, at Georgetown. Um, and Key had just moved to the nation's capital. He was sort of looking for a way to, I think, to introduce himself to future clients, uh, legal clients. And so he sent, wrote a song for a dinner in Stephen Decatur's honor called When the Warrior Returns from the Battle of Far. So we know for a fact that Key knew this melody that later was used for the Star Spangled Banner because he had written a previous set of lyrics to the exact same tune. So what Key does when he's you know trapped aboard ship, not in a moment of inspiration, but actually for um, like 72 hours, like three days, um, from Wednesday morning when he sees the flag till Friday night before he, he comes back to Baltimore Harbor, um, is that he very carefully constructs a set of lyrics to, to I think, tactically... Um, 
encourage unity, to encourage um, a strong military, to encourage piety, these sort of things that he wants to see happen. It's a kind of protest lyric, if you will, because it's, it's talking about a, a world that he sees rather than a world that he's living in. It's a world that he hopes for. But he uses that previous song, When the Warrior Returns, as his model um, for the Star Spangled Banner. So the, the phrase Star Spangled, for example, which Francis Scott Key is the person who inv- used that adjectival phrase first to talk about the U.S. flag. It was known as Old Glory before that, other things, but it was never known as the Star Spangled Banner until Key penned that phrase. But he talks about the Star Spangled Flag of our nation, not the Star Spangled Banner, but the Star Spangled Flag um, in 1805 in that earlier lyric. So you can see a lot of echoes in the Star Spangled Banner from that earlier lyric. So it's it's really part of this very vibrant tradition of political songwriting. If you will, it's the kind of tweets and TikToks of early America. It was the way in which people brought emotion into the service of their political hopes and dreams. So let's move on to the, the story of the banner in the 20th century. It's become a ritual at virtually every sporting event from Little League games to National Football League. How did that happen? So, yeah, the story of the anthem in sports is really interesting because it was not common in the early history of American professional sports. The the very first time I was able to document the Star Spangled Banner being performed for a professional sporting event in America was actually during the Civil War, uh, May of 1862 in, in Brooklyn, New York, for a baseball game. Um, but in the 19th century, if you wanted to have music at a sporting event, you had to have live musicians. You had to have a band. We had no recording and more importantly, we didn't have public address systems that could amplify a recording, you know, to a crowd. So recording, you know, is invented in 1877 by Thomas Edison, but it's not until the 1920s that we have public address systems that can amplify a recording for a crowd. So if you're going to have music in the 19th and early 20th century at a, at a sporting game, you have to have a band. And so you used it for opening day special occasions and for sort of the World Series. So we know that the Star Spangled Banner was played um, at the very first World Series in 1903 um, and pretty everyone after that. It's it's not until 1917 that we, as part of World War One, that we see the Star Spangled Banner at least can be documented to be performed before in t- every game of the World Series. And um, I think what really happens is that in World War One. Um, American professional sports is facing an existential crisis. Um, Professional sports are deemed a non-essential occupation. So if you are a fighting age male in America, you are required to be um, working in a wartime occupation. So you had to either be in the military or working in a business that was supporting the military, like manufacturing planes. Um, So um, athletes who were, of course, in great physical shape were prime candidates for the draft for for being brought into the U.S. military. So many of the players in American baseball were drafted and teams were decimated. They, they, you know, they had pitching staffs of six or eight and they were down to one or two um, players um, for the the World Series that year. So the um, professional sports leagues started to ally themselves with patriotism really for their own economic self-interest to be able to to show that they were part of the war effort that they were part of the battle for hearts and minds on the home front so because world war one ended pretty quickly i mean the united states got involved um in i think 1916 and then 1918 the war's over um so it's or maybe it was even 17 i'll have to <laughs> should look that up um, but very quickly, the United States comes in at the end of the war, and then the, the war ends You know, just a little over a year after that. So professional sports, professional baseball, which was the major sport at that time, is, is saved because of armistice, um, because the war ends relatively quickly. When World War II rolled around, um, sports were not going to be caught you know, b- behind the, the eight ball, if you will. Be, um, they were not going to be declared non-essential. And so sports teams really got out in front of this. And this this one of the things that surprised me. I really thought that Pearl Harbor, that December 9th, you know, 1941, would be the day that the Star Spangled Banner exploded in American life. Um, and actually, it's it's it happens before. It happens in the late 1930s by um, the summer of 1941, so before Pearl Harbor the Star Spangled Banner is being played at every professional sports game in the United States. Like every baseball um, game is starting with the Star Spangled Banner. And it's it's really, I think, the, the feeling of threat, the feeling of uncertainty that that brings people together, that rallies them around the national anthem. And, and the song starts to, makes people feel that they can 
withstand, that they'll be able to to survive this brewing international crisis of World War II. So from World War II on, we've, we've really had the Star Spangled Banner. And in fact, one of the cool things that I found that's in my book is a photograph um, of, of President Truman in 1945 meeting with the commissioner of uh, the, the National Football League, which is, is not the powerhouse it is today. It's, it's sort of at the beginning of the growth of, of football in America. But he gives the president a golden ticket to any game. And he promises at that point that the Star Spangled Banner is not going to just be played at wartime, that it's going to be an every game anthem, that it will be as much, he says, literally, it will be as much a part as football game as the kickoff. And that's the, the first time we can document a promise from a sports league to play the Star Spangled Banner at every game. We're going to play, and, uh, and I, I'm just going to do it as an example because we're going to run out of time, Whitney Houston at the Super Bowl in 1991. Mark Clegg, for you, that Whitney Houston performance is a de- definitive one. Why is that? Yeah, I think it's it's considered by many people to be the best performance of the national anthem ever. And I think it's the passion and the devotion that she communicates um, through her voice. You know, what's, what's really interesting about the music is that it's actually pretty non-traditional. Um, it, what, it, this might be a little bit too much musician speak, but there's there's an extra beat added to every single measure of the Star Spangled Banner in her performance. So it feels more like a, a slow march or maybe more importantly, like a church hymn than it does like the Star Spangled Banner, which is in a rolling triple meter, sort of like a waltz. Um, so one, two, th- oh, say, can you three, two, three? And she sings, oh, say, two, three, four, one, two, three. And it gives her voice sort of time to expand and really blossom. But it also allows her to bring in these kind of gospel stylings that that sort of take the anthem to church, if you will. And so I th- when people hear that performance, which, of course, was at the very beginning of the first Gulf War, it was a time of, of sort of crisis in American identity, um, a real threat to the the world and the nation and and she sort of captures I think that moment for people um, by sort of making this sacred message of devotion to the the nation and so when people hear that version they don 't think of the ornamentation they don 't think of the gospel silings they don 't think of the changes to the music or the harmony. What they think of is this is true, this is real this this woman believes what she 's saying she 's embodying the ideals of the lyric. And I, and I think it's an incredibly powerful statement from a, a black woman singing to, you know, a national audience, an international audience, at really what is the most prominent performance annually of the Star Spangled Banner, which is the, the Super Bowl. If, uh, if the positive aspect of this is that the banner builds community, the, you write that the negative is that it's become a straitjacket and any deviation invites controversy. I wanted to show a couple examples of that, starting with uh, one that you cite in April 28, 2006, the Nuestro Himno. Uh, Let's listen to a little bit of a clip of that version of the Star Spangled Banner. Mark Clegg, it immediately became controversial, but your research suggests that people have been translating the Star Spangled Banner for a very long time. Yeah, that that 2006 um, version was released at a time of you know intense debate during the Bush administration about immigration policy, and of course we're still struggling and haven't solved that pro- problem today. Um, but it was meant to show that there were many sort of loyal Americans in the United States who spoke Spanish as their primary language. What people didn't realize at the time that that particular version was actually that that translation was commissioned by the U.S. government during World War I as a Spanish translation to build sort of support for the U.S. effort. I mean, not only to, to help Americanize and, and recognize Spanish speakers at home, but to reach out to Latin America and sort of places that might get involved in the war. And so we we have used as as a nation 
um, translation as a tool to welcome a broader set of Americans to the nation and to allow them to express their patriotism in their native tongue, um, not in a way that sort of disables or contradicts the English version of the Star Spangled Banner, but in ways that I think broaden it. So I've found um, over 100 translations of the Star Spangled Banner in more than 40 languages, beginning in 1851 with a version actually from Texas, New Braunfels, Texas, um, of the anthem in German that was actually used as a recruiting tool in the Civil War to bring German speakers into the Union Army. And surprising to me was the fact that 20% of the Union Army was of German descent and spoke German um, during the U.S. Civil War. Another transformative performance in a negative way was in 1990, Roseanne Barr at the San Diego Padres game. Let's listen. What happened to Roseanne Barr's career after that performance? Yeah, no, I remember the firestorm well um, in 1990, and she was vilified. I mean, she was, it was interpreted as her sort of intentionally insulting the nation. Um, she, of course, was a huge media figure at this time. She had the number one TV show in the nation, Roseanne, um, all sorts of, of projects. But she, but she represented this sort of iconoclastic character. And I I actually concluded... Well, for many years, I tried to avoid writing about this one um, because I just find it so personally grating. But I ended up developing some sympathy for Roseanne Barr because I think she tried to to sing it well. She started out too high and ran out of range. And the crowd turned against her and started booing and hissing her. And then I think she just went into character to try to make the best of a bad situation and and really ended up making it much, much worse um, by doubling down and and saying that she thought she sang it really, really well. So people saw it as an intentional insult rather than just a, a you know innocent mistake in the end you write that the song taught her a lesson about herself as, as well as the nation what did she learn i think you know she learned that she had the freedom to try again i mean she ends up um in a later um much more recent television show i think a reality show she did on on cable um singing the anthem again for a, a little league uh, game and she sings it well and I think she learned that the fear and the, the, the bad memory of that, that she had, as an American, had the freedom to, to try again and to, to correct that mistake. So it's, it was an inspiring story that, that she came back and, and sort of did it in a way that, that she, she was proud of in the end. About 15 minutes left. Uh, talk to me a bit about the history of the banner and the civil rights movement. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I was able to trace... Um, lots of connections between the anthem and the civil rights movement. And I think today in the sort of polarized environment now where we see the the anthem and the question of slavery, you know, where does slavery fit in American history? There's this incredible tension between sort of patriotism and progressivism. And I think one of the things my book tries to do is show that, that patriotism and progressivism actually were allied in many parts of American history and that the notion of using the anthem as a protest song is actually part of its very tradition, part of its history. And one of the places where I was able to find that was actually in the civil rights movement. So there were protests, for instance, in New York that I document where, um, you know, a Groups protesting unequal hiring practices and the construction industry sort of laid down in front of equipment and and stopped a construction site and they all these men and women and children um, sang the Star Spangled Banner um, in order to express a civil rights protest and I was able to document another performance in Selma you know right after the the sort of um, violence on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. The next day, um, there's a prayer vigil all the way overnight, and at dawn, all of those assembled in Selma, Alabama, sing the Star Spangled Banner to start the day. And so, the the message really is that we're Americans too. I think I think every time the Star Spangled Banner is performed, there's a claim of belonging, um, whether it's in translation or whether it's sung in a different style by Whitney Houston with sort of gospel um, elements, for example. That that says. You know, that that I'm here, I'm American, I'm part of this story, I'm part of this patriotic message. And there's a message of devotion that patriotism 
communicates a hope to make the nation live up to its ideals. So, so for me, um, really understanding the role and recovering the role of the Star Spangled Banner alongside, you know, um, this is the light of mine and we shall overcome and, you know, all of the sort of civil rights anthems that we, we think of with the, the um, civil rights movement. I mean, right before uh, Martin Luther King gave the I Have a Dream speech, the Star Spangled Banner was sung. I mean, this, this was really, it was a claim to being American, to wanting America to live up to its ideals, to wanting the rights and privileges, the citizenship rights of being American, and not calling for revolution, for, for destroying the country, but really calling for reform, calling for recognition. Well, let's show a very well-known protest about the Star Spangled Banner, and that is Colin Kaepernick's in 2016. For the land, hand of the free. Overnight, San Francisco 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick refusing to stand during the national anthem again. This time, he took a knee right behind hundreds of service members being honored on Military Appreciation Night. As the crowd and players stand, you can see Kaepernick kneeling on the sideline. Teammate Eric Reed joining him. Going to stay. And he's receiving heavy boos here. The crowd booing every time he took a snap. Mark Clay, how did you come to view Colin Kaepernick's protest? I, I came to be incredibly grateful for Colin Kaepernick for drawing attention to the issues of race and the history of the Star Spangled Banner. I mean, I initially intended to write my book for the bicentennial of the anthem, which would have been 2014. And I think I would have written a pretty different book because when Kaepernick took a knee to to really point out that the country wasn't living up to its ideals. I mean, it's not a protest of the song so much of as using this, the ritual of the song as a platform, as an opportunity to draw attention to another issue. Um, when he took a knee, it, it sort of brought the whole issue of the stories we tell about America um, to the fore. And I think um, the Black Lives Matter movement really challenged me as a historian to dig much more deeply into the resonance of Jimi Hendrix's performance, Whitney Houston's performance, into the very you know use of the anthem in protest. One of the amazing things I came across, and this was just a, a, a bit of luck in searching through early African-American protests um, or African-American newspapers was evidence of the very first time an African-American refused to stand for the Star Spangled Banner and actually was December of 1860. So right before the Civil War, Lincoln had just been elected. And the, the big question was, you know, would slavery be ended in America? Would Lincoln's election lead to the end of slavery or would the nation yet again compromise and accommodate slavery um, for a, a unity of the North and the South? So the, um, the, you know, Kaepernick is part of a long tradition of using the anthem for protest. And for me, the reference to freedom, the reference to bravery that's in Key's lyric, his invocation of the nation's ideal it, it it's an actually an opportunity it, it creates uses or i'm mean, saying it forges the anthem as a kind of alarm bell if you will i mean when when the anthem makes us uncomfortable when this sort of celebration of unity is at a moment when of when we can actually see disunity and that's what kaepernick does i mean when he kneels he shows us wait a minute this is not just a comfortable unity that something else is going on here it, it makes us question things and i think the anthem's ability to create dissonance, to make us aware of of people who maybe aren't being served equally by the nation's ideals, um, is a power of the song that to me is really valuable. I see it as a kind of barometer of freedom, and that actually it's evocation of freedom, which is was pretty ironic um, in 1844 when the first abolitionist lyric was written to the tune of the Star Spangled Banner, calling for the end of slavery, and used its reference to freedom to to sort of point out that many many people in the United States were not free. Um, but that, that history of the anthem and protest for me is what makes it valuable. We have about five minutes left. I'm going to close with a very traditional version of it at the inauguration.
Mark Clegg, there are calls by people who don't like the origin of the Star Spangled Banner in our society to replace it with something else. Uh, what is your response when you hear those cries for replacement? Um, I do think that probably there is a need to at least make it explicit what the Star Spangled Banner is. I mean, the, the law in 1931 that names the Star Spangled Banner, the official national anthem of the United States, is pretty ambiguous. It just says, literally, the words and music known as the Star Spangled Banner is the national anthem. And it doesn't tell you what those words are exactly. So the fact that the third verse and its reference to slave um, was not removed intentionally, um, as it was in all government publications up to that time, um, probably needs to be made explicit today. And I think that would be an affirmative message of inclusion. Um, Replacing the anthem will be incredibly controversial. I mean, and I I think I would find it to be um, sad in the sense that it would not, it would deny this history, which to me, and I've written this whole book about it, of course, <laughs> but to me, it's valuable to see American history through the Star Spangled Banner and that having a song that, that celebrates the ideal of freedom and its corollary of equality and sort of the bravery of the nation to live up to those ideals, to me, serves as a kind of bellwether that helps guide us into the future. So I think there is value in the Star Spangled Banner. I, I think it's possible too that we could think of those sort of anthem moments in professional sports and in our civic ritual as, as referring more to a repertory. Maybe we should be playing America the Beautiful. Maybe we should be playing God Bless America or Lift Every Voice and Sing. That other songs could be used in that sort of ritualistic moment that would broaden the notion, I think, of what American patriotism is, that I would I would welcome that change. But in terms of changing the song, it's really going to be up to the American people, not up to the legislature. So the, the, as I said, I think the thing that made the anthem what it is was the U.S. Civil War, was American cultural practice, the way people used the song in American civic ritual. It wasn't the, a bill in Congress and a president's signature. So if, if we're going to have a new song, it's going to mean that there's going to have to be another moment in American history that's going to capture imagination of the nation, that there's a, a moment we're celebrating a heroic moment that someone celebrates in song, and that song will have to catch fire with the American people in a way that I think speaks to everyone. And when that happens, there's going to be a, a tide that, that will just wave over, over the country that I think will, will take us into a new realm. And it, it may change the song. It may be a new lyric. It may be a new performance. Um, only time will tell. But I think it's, it's really, you know, we the people who get to decide what our anthem is by, by what music we use in these moments of civic celebration. The book is titled, Oh Say Can You Hear, a cultural biography of the Star-Spangled Banner. And I'm very appreciative of the hour with Mark Clegg, the author of the book, who also has a Star-Spangled Music Foundation, which has teaching materials about the banner and more. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Susan. Great to talk to you. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. And subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome. 